this webinar uh, is organized by the Wall Academy of Arts and Science to introduce the out-of-box thinking uh, on significant contemporary opportunities and threats that could lead actually to the action towards exciting new future and accompanying uh, sustainability as well as high quality of life and human security. So it's a part of human security for all initiative. Uh, today's first two speakers are going to be Ivo Schlaus, uh, who is a Croatian academic, honorary president of World Academy, uh, honorary member of Club of Rome, funding member of uh, Academia Europea, chairman of SEDVES, advisory board, and, you know, besides all other titles he carries, he's a, a multiple professor at different universities, everything stretching from UCLA, uh, mm -hmm. Duke, uh, Kyoto, ELTH and other. Uh, and second one is going to be Alexander Zidenshek, who is Vice Dean for Study Matters, uh, the Joseph Stefan Institute, researcher, uh, the Joseph Stefan Institute, professor at the University of Maribor, fellow and trustee of uh, VAS, as well as a member of SEDVES, former Fulbright fellow, etc., as well as the president of Slovenian Association to Club of Rome. So with this, I would first ask Professor Zidenshev to uh, give an introduction. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And I will give the floor to Professor Schlaus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, it is an honor to actually start by saying that the contemporary world uh, is faced with many problems, uh, essentially three threats dominate. One, of course, is the war. The other is the destruction of uh, natural and human capital. Of course, we all know the problem of the climate warming. As a matter of fact, uh, it has now the acronym weather of uh, mass destruction, the same as weapons of mass destruction. And of course, uh, we are as well destroying the human capital. The second, the third problem is, of course, uh, the new emerging technology. One of them, of course, is the artificial intelligence. The second is the synthetic biology. And, of course, many new are coming. And unfortunately, we know very little about that. The purpose of the discussion today is just to connect uh, somehow and look for new out of the box ideas in these two sections, in these two uh, topics that I have emphasized the destruction of the capital and the forthcoming technology. Thank you very much and good meeting. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you, all uh, our senior uh, colleagues who recognize the dangers of wars and the necessity to stop them. But most of all, you are dedicated to the future of humanity. Uh, and as you can see, we also include some younger fellows. Uh, Uroš, who introduced us, is a very successful professor of nanotechnology who is using plasma to obtain amazing nanostructures. Uh, and as you heard, uh, our intention today is to bring out the best synergies between AI and human security, potentially leading to great results. And also, we all know science is unpredictable, so you never know what you can get. And we hopefully we really get some great ideas uh, today. Uh, and therefore, we will following the, this warm up, uh, uh, have some warm up encouragement by both presidents, first from the Club of Rome and then uh, uh, also from the World Academy later. Uh, we have distinguished guests, uh, Phoebe Condori from Athens, John Miller on AI and Kenneth Stokes also on AI. And uh, then we will focus on brainstorming. Hopefully we come up with at least one idea deserving attention and potentially leading to new avenues of solutions. So let us enjoy this event, do our best. And I pass the floor now to our colleague from Croatia, Anna Jerkovic, uh, who is an, another young power of World Academy and she will chair the next session. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you, Uraš. Thank you, uh, Akademician Schlaus, for inspiring words for starting this uh, important uh, webinar on sustainable future. I'm very pleased to be a part of it. So uh, the first session is called Building Peace Opportunities. 
Uh, which is something uh, that we should keep in focus and actually never lose focus on how to build peace, how to return to peace in the current circumstances, how to keep peace and make it sustainable. So as we know, uh, without peace, there is no development and no sustainable development. And without sustainability, there is no security and no future. So in this session, as you mentioned, Alexander, we have two extraordinary speakers, and I'm very much looking forward to hear their ideas ideas, uh, visions and solutions for uh, current social, economic and security issues. So uh, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Paul Srivastava, Professor of Management and Organizations from the Pennsylvania State University, who is currently the co-president of the Club of Rome. So the topic is weapon of mass construction. Very interesting. So a change of paradigm and a new narrative. Uh, so Mr. Srivastava, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Alexander, and also Ivo for the inspiring words, and Uros and Anna for your introduction. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, uh, thank you for putting together this very timely and important conversation on sustainable futures. I have five minutes to solve the simple problem of world peace and bringing an end to all wars, because wars are not useful solutions for humanity. So let's start with it. Alexander, with your call for out of the box thinking and actions towards alternative future, we really need to completely get rid of the box and start afresh because war and peace are now the central challenges even before climate change. We can't solve climate if we are at war with each other. As the webinar description says, we need alternative approaches to preventing wars and the use of the weapons of mass destruction, including stopping all wars now. So we need to pursue aggressively uh, human security by waging peace on the world. Peace has been a central premise of the work of the Club of Rome since our very founding. Without peace, there can be no sustainability. Peace among nations and peoples is a precondition for humanity to fight the much bigger war of climate change. If we waste our energy and our resources fighting each other, we will never win the war of climate change. So the Club of Rome makes public statements about wars when they emerge. And we did that in the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia war. And in the last six months, there has been a debate within the Club of Rome of issuing a statement on the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza. Many members have demanded it. We've had hundreds of emails and text messages, phone conversations with members, and even a discussion at our executive committee. And we came to the conclusion that a single short statement on peace in Gaza was not likely to be effective. Instead, we decided to publish a collection of essays by members that imagine conditions for eliminating all wars, titled Enduring Peace in the Anthropocene. So, since the Club of Rome is a think tank and a do tank, we also strive to do something about implementing peace. And the current context of rebuilding Gaza offers us a great opportunity to consider how you human security actions can be achieved through technological tools, which are the two big themes of this webinar. Of course, Gaza needs rebuilding in many, many ways, including humanitarian aid and healthcare, food, shelter, justice, et cetera. But let me focus just on a very small part of the rebuilding and reconstruction of human security task, which is education. Since many of you at the World Academy of Arts and Sciences are, are from educational institutions, I thought I will focus on that. In Gaza, more than one, 800 lower schools and 17 higher education institutions have been either partially bombed or entirely destroyed. Gaza's population is disproportionately young. Around 65% of the population is under the age of 24. 6,000 students have died. All university campuses have been destroyed and all the rest of the university students are now without educational options. Students around the world are protesting the war on their own campuses. Human security, in my view, is unimaginable without education and scholarship. There's an appeal in an open letter from the university presidents for help 
Gaza University presidents for help to prevent what they call scholasticide and to rebuild universities. So they're making an opening for educationists from around the world to join in this task. Education, of course, involves many things. In Gaza, the basic structures of normal life and human connection are shattered, and those need to be fixed. That will require deep human engagement and financial commitment. But there are many other aspects of education that can be technologically mediated. So I would pose the question to you, can technology help to revive university education in Gaza? Can education function in Gaza be reconstructed with the help of technology? What would massive reconstruction look like? And let me offer a design challenge to our audience today. And the design challenge is to build a weapon of mass construction of education and of peace through education. What would that look like? What technologies would it involve? What platforms? How could we deploy it? How could existing universities and academics around the world engage? How could internet and AI be leveraged to build this weapon of mass construction? I hope this webinar series and was with its considerable educational assets can grapple with this challenge and lead us to some useful and actionable suggestions. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Professor Shivastava. I think that you raised so many important questions and those are really the key questions. So what can we do to be a weapon of construction, a weapon of peace, a weapon of good in this world full of conflict? So I think that we can uh, go back to all these questions, maybe even answer it throughout this webinar. So for now, thank you very much. And we will go on with the second speaker, uh, which is Professor Fib Kunduri, Professor of Economics at the Athens University of Economics and Business and Director of the Research Laboratory on Socioeconomic and Environmental Sustainability. Professor Kunduri is a world-renowned uh, environmental economics professor and global leader in sustainable development. So the topic of this presentation is if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it, you cannot improve it. The holistic, interdisciplinary and intradisciplinary way towards the sustainability transformation. So Professor Kunduri, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for having me today. This is a very interesting discussion. I agree we need the weapons of mass construction and that education and capacity building is the answer. Um, to the structure of this weapon. Um, we are in a difficult situation of multi-crisis. Of course, we all know that it's not just the inability to collaborate. It is the difficulties with regards to economic growth, uh, low growth rate, economic growth rates, inflationary pressures, shrinking fiscal spaces, uh, increasing inequalities between the global south and the global north, increasing inequalities within uh, countries. And all of this leads to tensions, some of them geopolitical, and uh, we end up in finding it increasingly difficult to coordinate. However, we have a manual and we have adopted the manual in 2015 in New York. We have the 17 sustainable development goals and the 169 targets within them that are a very good framework in which we can figure out how to put together our ecosystems with our economic activity and our social resilience. These are the 17 goals that bring all of this together in a very holistic, integrated, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary way. And they are at the moment the only global agenda, the only agenda on which we have an agreement on. And it's a good agenda, scientists will tell you. Scientists like me who work in the interdisciplinary uh, spectrum of a science who have a firm focus on a firm belief that almost no problem is single discipline. The current problems and challenges are 
interdisciplinary and the solutions have to be found in an interdisciplinary framework. So we need the science-based collaboration at first to identify the solutions, to create the technology. And may I say we are good at this. We have lots of technology, interesting technology. We have lots of science, interesting answers to our problems. We know how to manage in a sustainable, a resilient way, the interaction between the economy, the society, and nature. We know how to do this. And we also know how to act in a transdisciplinary way. What does this mean? With the scientific basis, identify it, you go to the stakeholders and you explain to them what are the problems, what are the solutions, and how the solutions can be financed and implemented. We have all this. So we have the science, we have the technology, we even have the finance, fiscal and uh, public-private uh, ventures. Uh, we have the business world that can create the money for implementation. What we don't have is the ability to implement. And the ability to implement basically is a function of some things that we have and some things that we don't have. As I said, we have knowledge from science, we have technology, enough technology, and the pace of advancement is techno in technology is huge. So I'm hopeful with regards to the solutions that will be, be deriving from there. We also have innovation that is not just technological, but also financial, fiscal, social innovation. So we have solutions. We uh, have interested stakeholders, but unfortunately we don't have the capacity that is needed to get the solutions talking to the problem owners. We don't have the capacity within the, stake, uh, the stakeholders, the problem owners to understand the problem and acquire the knowledge and skills that are needed to implement the solutions. So there is a lot of mistrust and fear in all elements of our lives, in politics, in policy making, in businesses, in financial institutions, in the civil society, in geopolitical structure. There is mistrust because I say one of the main reasons of this mistrust is the lack of capacity to deeply understand, understand the problems and deeply understand solutions that are beneficial to everybody. There are solutions that can increase the welfare and then you can distribute the welfare in a way that is equitable and in a way that it is acceptable by all the co-designers. But you don't have the co-designers because they don't have the capacity, they don't have the knowledge and the skills to understand the problem. They are afraid of the solutions. They believe that they will be left behind. So I'm going back to where I started and where the first speaker stopped, education, knowledge, upskilling, reskilling, and co-designing with all the relevant stakeholders. Start speaking to each other, start understanding each other, and what's more important, start trusting each other in order to acquire the capacity to sustain our welfare, to sustain our living first, and then um, uh, welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that is the key problem, trust today, how to rebuild this trust and how to 
how to bring all the stakeholders together to uh, talk like this, like we are talking on this webinar openly uh, with trust, with knowledge and sharing skills. So yes, I think that is really one of the key questions and we should really, uh, an investment in education is always the best investment. So I hope that also with this webinar, we will contribute to further this, uh, to foster this dialogue with all the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, before we go to the next session, I would just like to mention uh, briefly the Stop the Wars Now statement. So uh, we had academician Ivo Schlaus on the beginning and uh, Alexander Zidoshek who drafted this statement. It is an appeal to stop all the wars uh, right now and return to diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, and many, many politicians, diplomats, scientists, experts signed this statement. And we, of course, we invite everyone uh, who is listening to us today to read it and to uh, support it with uh, with their signature. I hope, I think that uh, the World Academy will share the link to everyone. So uh, the Stop the War statement is a sort of a follow up of the Russell Einstein Manifesto and aims to appeal to our humanity, which connects us, uh, everyone, everyone in the world, uh, a cosmopolitan uh, awareness and a universal humanism, universal brotherhood and sisterhood. So so uh, we appeal to our humanism and with this statement, we try to, uh, as you mentioned, Hibi, uh, and uh, Paul, uh, to uh, connect uh, all stakeholders, to make them aware uh, what are we doing with our future and the uh, how peace has to be a priority. So we invite everyone to sign it. And with this, we finish this first panel. Thank you very much to the speakers. Please stay with us. And now I would like to give the floor to Thomas Reuter, who will moderate the next session on breakthrough technologies. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, our next session will uh, look at the impact of technologies. And we all know that uh, technology has two sides. It's a bit, little bit like the uh, story of the uh, magician's apprentice. Sometimes technologies have unexpected consequences. I don't think anyone was thinking of climate change when they uh, started the fossil fuel age and the associated technology of combustion. Um, and it's the same today, and there's no better example than uh, artificial intelligence. And the, the other problem is, of course, human. Uh, the fact that early adopters are often military intelligence, private uh, vested interests, and indeed organized crime. So there's a human factor, but also the technology itself we haven't really seen a, a, a systematic application of a precautionary principle in rolling out science, and the stakeholders are usually not at the table until much later. And to do something about it, John Miller and Kenneth Stokes will talk about AGI and AI. Uh, John is CEO of Integrated Media Company, and Kenneth is uh, president and CEO of the World Sustainability Forum. I'll mm -hmm. hand over to John. Uh, thank you, and um, I'm very, very appreciative to have a few moments to talk here today and also to listen to the great speakers and, and ideas that have been put forth already. Um, I love the concept of weapons of mass construction. I, I will be using that. Um, I am a, an investor in, in uh, news and information and education, and most recently um, as uh, in, me, in AI. So I will, I will, I'll talk about AI today. And uh, as was just said, all technologies have dual use. In fact, uh, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, uh, recently just said, all technology is dual use, and we must be honest about that. And I think the first thing that's very important is we do need to be honest about both sides of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both sides uh, right now. And first, I'm going to start with some of the context setting and, frankly, some things that to me are concerning, and then I'll take a little bit more optimistic uh, view, if you will, in, in, the, in the second couple of minutes. So um, I think what we all, development of AI into the development of AGI, and the way that looks is there's a new AI model that sort of, that replaces what's been before at the current pace of 12 to 18 months. That is an extraordinarily fast uh, development. And that is, that is continuing to proceed apace. Interpol suggests that by 2026, 
90% of online content uh, will be generated or in part generated by AI, 90% of online content um, in just a couple of years. This is a very near term uh, question. And it raises a, a number of issues such as what is real in that context. And it's not just an addition at that point to, to the online environment, it's, it's the, it is the online environment. So that also is rapidly changing around us. Um, and a further correlation is it's not just online because with the what's called the Internet of Things, the connected devices that are around us all the time, uh, if 90% of that and, and, what, and those instructions are being generated by AI, again, it becomes the environment around us all the time. Now, there's one other thing that's a little bit technical, but is very interesting and very important to understand, and this goes towards AGI. How much you could put input into um, an LLM, if you're familiar with that, an AI, such as ChatGPT, was very restricted until recently. Currently, you can now input about a million characters at a time, um, which may sound like a lot, but it's not infinite. It's about to become, for all intents and purposes, infinite. You can put in as much instructions as you can literally create. Well, what this means in print in practice is that AI, an AI can generate something and then use that as an input for further AI it's itself or other AIs and become essentially reflexive, i.e. AI can program AI. That's when we're starting down the road to AGI, and that is literally imminent this year or potentially next, as, I, as I've been told. So we're really at the cusp of these developments being uh, extraordinarily fast. And then, you know, maybe one more point uh, before I start turning to what I think is a little more optimistic scenario uh, scenarios is um, how do we as humans know what an AI knows? And the answer to that question is you can only know by using AI. There are no humans that can understand all and process all the information that are, will be, that are and will be inside these AIs. So you have to use AI to know what AI knows. There, there's no other way to do it. And again, that becomes reflexive both for the AIs themselves, which can lead down towards AGI, um, but also it means that uh, we have to think of AI, in my opinion, as both uh, a significant uh, risk, but also the only way to have a true solutions for some of the issues that AI raises uh, is to use AI itself. Um, and the second point, as I'm saying, is I'm speaking to kind of the bridge from where we are now to AGI, artificial general intelligence. And you can see from some of the examples I've cited, the building blocks are starting to be there. And this, this is now, um, you know, we can see, you can see the pieces coming together. So let me take the, now let me switch in the last couple of minutes uh, um, to, I think, a more optimistic uh, scenario, which is what can AI do that, you know, we really can take some comfort in and some excitement about? And, and I'll just read a few things from my notes. Uh, one is in, in healthcare, uh, which is a very important topic for WAS. We, it can significantly reduce the time required for designing new drugs, for example, and, and to create novel therapies. It can transform global education. For example, um, AI's potential to revo revolutionize global education is a key opportunity for personalized learning, self-paced and affordable education. It can help to govern with positive impact. And WAS emphasizes the, uh, um, the, the critical need for global governance of AI to encourage its positive applications while preventing misuse. It can combat disinformation and, and misinformation, even though it can also generate it, uh, with potentially generating up to 90% of online content, as I said, it can also detect the, the issues involved there and, which, and what is real. And finally, the complex global interdisciplinary issues that we have, AI's ability to process vast amounts of data and identify patterns can be harnessed to tackle intricate global issues like climate change, food insecurity, and conflict prevention, which are critical components of human security. Now, in the last things I've said, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm reading, I'm reading the responses from an AI that I got uh, when I asked an AI the following question. 
by the way, it's perplexity.ai if uh, folks are into that sort of thing. So I asked Perplexity AI, what are the biggest opportunities to use AI to achieve the human security goals of the World Academy of Art and Science? And those are some of the answers I got. So I think as you can see, it is develop AI is developing very rapidly. It has the ability to delve into the areas that we, can, we are most concerned with and um, be a force for good or a force for, for, for chaos and other things. But the only way through, in my opinion, this is a pr provocative, uh, potentially provocative concept I'd just like to leave everyone with, is we need to embrace AI in order to deal with AI and to deal with the issues of AI. Otherwise, we will not be able to do that given the rapid pace of development and how it is becoming its own entities along the way very quickly now. So I'll stop there, but, uh, but thank you for giving me a few minutes to, to try to frame some of these issues up. Thanks, uh, John, and I uh, hand over to Kenneth uh, for your presentation, please. Before we well, take some uh, one-minute uh, responses, uh, just some one-minute quick responses uh, after that. Thank you. Uh, um, I'd like to make a couple of remarks um, that pertain to the, the nexus of AI, what I call science uh, 2.0 uh, technology uh, as, as well. Um, and I guess as a, an appropriate segue from, uh, from Dr. Miller's remark um, and on the role of on the AI side, um, we're looking at the opportunity within the World Sustainability Forum. We have an AI lab at uh, Prescience Breakthrough Science and Technology uh, using um, multifaceted um, generative AI programs. We have a number of projects underway um, and all of them at this point in time reflect a growing interest in developing methods for early detection of scientific advances, including innovative technologies leading to more effective uh, solutions. Uh, every year, we have about uh, five and a half million scientific articles published, uh, and buried within them are some interesting ideas. Many of those interesting ideas are not revealed to us in a way that we can digest, uh, hence the need for AI to help understand some of those ideas and identify some of those ideas that are promising. And that's the direction that the world sustainability is taking. Uh, at this point, we have proof of concept uh, leading to a platform for the development of a foundation model for trauma-informed uh, mental health care. We're using a generative AI model, uh, a very extensive trauma-related uh, data, scientific articles, if you will, to provide those breakthrough insights, to identify those breakthrough insights. It's a data-first approach um, in which promising innovations can be identified without relying on prior hypotheses or underlying normative ontologies and can be iteratively uh, refined by constantly updating uh, the knowledge base. We can only do that by using AI itself. So it's uh, a process uh, that is distinct from what's known as lexical analytics. We're using graph neural networks to identify anomalous um, information and an algorithm to support that. We're also using what's known as a novel cascade prediction model to, in the one instance, discover non-obvious relationships in the corpus of data. Secondly, identify candidate solutions that are really unlikely to be otherwise discovered or pursued as well. Now, to enable all this, uh, the frontier of the science in trauma-informed care is characterized as a complex research uh, hypergraph that indicates path-breaking or at least potentially prescient developments in the science of trauma-informed care. Uh, the benefits of it in part of the whole program are eroding siloed data. Most of the data that we're generating from whatever sources is really seldom used. 
um, conversation, for example, several weeks ago with uh, people at the European Space Agency suggested that only 80% of the data that they're generating from uh, Earth satellite observations are actually being used. And so they're encouraging us, and, and you as well, of course, uh, to engage with them in, in exploring the data that's not being used. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, underutilized scientific data, uh, all of which can help us with the development of models uh, to help uh, researchers, to help clinicians uncover new ideas and apply them to the frontier of, uh, of innovations. This is using AI. We're applying this to uh, trauma-informed care, mental health care. We're also applying this to system science. One of the uh, persistent problems with existing AI, um, generative AI models, is that they are for the most part, replicating uh, old concepts. Uh, and you can look at uh, the prompts and responses from any generative AI model today. And for the most part, they're not suggesting any paradigm changes whatsoever. Uh, so we really need to populate uh, the, the literature and the models uh, with uh, more interesting algorithms to generate more interesting candidate solutions. We're doing the same thing with respect to uh, the issues of peace, a program that we have running uh, within the World Sustainability Forum. So the bottom line, what we're doing is using AI to generate improved AI, to generate innovative solutions. Uh, at the same time, very cautious about the approach to innovative solutions mm -hmm. themselves. So let me leave you with uh, a quote from... Uh, uh, Professor Stafford Beer from 1992, uh, who said, not all problems can be solved, but be, we may be able to dissolve them through effective regulatory design. Stafford spoke of dissolving global governance systems that is suffering from a systemic crisis characterized by regulatory collapse. So therefore we need innovative solutions, but we also need innovative approaches to dissolve the structures that generate the crisis, including war and the absence of human security. And I'll leave there and welcome any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, very interesting. I uh, hear uh, comments on the uh, potential of AI to help us uh, process these mountains of scientific data that we're producing constantly, um, and data from other sources too, in order to see patterns, perhaps uh, build uh, models and theories even. Um, I'm thinking of astronomy, for example, different fields that I have some insights in. But anyway, um, we're asking now for some very short uh, comments or synergies, as we call them. Uh, one minute, please, no more. Uh, that uh, uh, could lead to some kind of breakthrough ideas. So if anybody has any sp specific ideas on the topic of AI or AGI, please go ahead. Uh, if I may, thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, first, I have uh, thanks to both our uh, presenters, uh, to John and Kenneth for your wonderful presentations. And then I have more of a challenge and an idea. Uh, so uh, on one hand, we know that this human society is a highly nonlinear. That means that a small change could actually have a huge effect. You know, like those ancient stories, like everybody was pulling the turnip, but then a little mouse joins and they are successful. So this kind of uh, uh, an approach. But the challenge is that given the dangers of current wars, uh, what would be like one innovative solution uh, that could prevent those people who are uh, having the button uh, for nuclear weapons from using them. Either this is a technological solution to stop the rockets from flying or a technological solution to break this chain of command so that somebody doesn't forward the command. So this would be my immediate challenge. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alexander. Uh, I think uh, Donato would like to Yes, no, I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I, I'm very intrigued by this concept of uh, um, AI. On the other hand, I'm not uh, uh, 
particularly fan. I mean, in terms of uh, my own perce- perception, at least, is that they're more the dangerous than the uh, than the real uh, utilities of this approach. But uh, this is more personal than anything else. Maybe it has to do with my uh, background, uh, um, and um, I I feel like. The flip side has to be also be thought uh, carefully. I mean, it's not only the positive uh, elements. I mean, in particular, I wonder, and this is a question to all those who are uh, seem to be uh, in, fa- in favor of, of the use of artificial intelligence in so many applications, is originality of thinking. I mean, uh, do you really believe that through uh, artificial intelligence we can come up with original thinking? Do you really think that... Uh, we are going to to have something that is, um, um, you know, that that uh, respects and that is in line with uh, uh, human principles. Since we are uh, very much into human security, we as World Academy, we propose the paradigm of human security as uh, uh, not a panacea of to, to all problems, but certainly uh, as the framework for action. Uh, so my question is, do you really think that through artificial intelligence uh, we can generate uh, new thinking or are we just assembling things from the past and not necessarily knowing uh, and drawing the lesson from the past? This is also the other risk that seems to me quite evident. What about, uh, um, you know, um, the, the, the cultures and, and the, uh, the experiences of the past? I feel that it's too much technology-driven and not uh, very much uh, humanistic. So this is a very uh, simple question, perhaps, but I think we, we, we should give ourselves time to, to reflect around the risks and not just uh, call for the benefits. Thanks, Donato. Um, uh, Kenneth or John, would you like to respond to that? Or is it somewhat of a question? Um, perhaps I'll make a, a very short remark. So um, it's it's possible we have proof of concept right now that you can identify what appear to be very disparate ideas that lead to a possible synthesis. Um, the AI technologies uh, that we're developing, the algorithms that we're developing within the AI lab of the World Sustainability Forum, are still um, moderated and mediated by humans, by scientists. Uh, so it's AI augmented. It's not AI um, uh, completely autonomous from um, historical perspectives and uh, and moral perspectives. It's it's all AI augmented. So there's still the human in the loop in our cases. Mm. But it is possible to identify, and we have proof of concept. Uh, that research papers from uh, 10 or 12 years ago, some of them lead to technologies uh, which leads in some instances to uh, definite solutions. And we've seen this in the domain of um, uh, therapeutic approaches in in medicine. We've seen this in the domain of, uh, for example, uh, cancer treatments in pancreatic cancer. So a paper that was published uh, by members of our group, uh, it would have been eight years ago, um, had already proven this, and there's an IEEE publication to indicate the result was rather interesting, whereas we expected uh, that we would be stormed by interesting parties and researchers and and corporations wanting to know more. The result was rather rather the opposite. That is... um, the pharmaceutical companies who are interested in using generative AI and other technologies to identify candidate uh, solutions, uh, small molecule, large molecule solutions, were not interested Hmm. because they had sunk costs. This was explained to us rather poignantly by by one uh, rather large pharmaceutical company and off the record entirely, so I can't name them. So they have sunk costs. They, they weren't interested in another technology. They were interested in recovering uh, those sunk costs and, and profiting from the existing technologies that they have. So there's profound path, dependent, path dependency in all of this. 
And I'll stop there. Thanks, Ken. So I completely agree with you. I'm sure there will be an avalanche of new discoveries uh, that are <clears throat> AI driven. What concerns me more is a human factor and the th uh, especially the fact that um, AI is so concentrated in terms of who controls it, who has the large data sets to uh, to um, feed the AI programs. And they are the big tech companies. But science is slowly catching up. And uh, that would be interesting to see. Phoebe, you have also a comment. It was a very quick comment to say that uh, any tool can be very fruitful in its application and very dangerous uh, in its application. So it depends on who uses this tool and um, what is interesting about the AI is the ability to connect information uh, there you can see if you play around with it a bit that in fields where you have long uh, history of very good research, uh, AI can answer questions and connect ideas in a way that is almost impossible for any human and is extremely useful. However, in areas where the science is thin, it's a new field, uh, and I can explicitly refer to sustainability, uh, the, the capacity of AI is very low. So, it's a matter of what you feed in there. Of course, the al algorithms can be become much more clever, but there will always be the need for the basic thinking to be produced and fed into the AI. So for me, AI, although it's artificial intelligence, is of course a very human driven um, um, uh, field and we should be able to understand its uh, strengths and dangers and regulate um, in order to hedge against the risks. And the risks of course have to do with data ownership, gathering, aggregation, use, and communication. And there is a lot of work for the lawyers and the policy makers there. But before mm -hmm. that, they need to understand um, how, how it works and how it can be regulated so that it works for the benefit of, of, of the people. It, it's, it's a very difficult thing to regulate. Mm, that, and we that's... should start working on, on that in a more substantial way. That's a very interesting... What we do now. Interesting point, Phoebe. Uh, I agree with you that we don't have the data sets on sustainability and especially sustainability solutions to 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 make good use of artificial intelligence in in kind of uh, analyzing those solutions make and fitting them to specific needs uh you know in a diverse world where you know local action really counts uh but we out of our time we've exhausted our time allotment and um I'm afraid I'll have to now uh, end this segment and hand over to Donato, uh, who's uh, moderating the section on uh, crisis, from crisis, crises to peace. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers and Thomas. And uh, I think here we have uh, some creating act to put together, uh, in particular because Probably Gary wants to make an intervention now or at the end. I don't know what you prefer. Uh, I think the agenda, you were there, but the the importance for us is also to reflect on the 
common security framework that uh, was that the World Academy of Rights and Science has produced, has put forward, that is based on human security. So how human security uh, can help us uh, to reinvent, uh, reinvent tools, reinvent action uh, towards uh, peace, uh, promotion of peace in general. Uh, I think that's actually uh, the ultimate target of human security, uh, of uh, its foundation, of uh, the importance to uh, create a, 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 you know, a, a better plurilateralism, uh, if not multilateralism anymore. Uh, but uh, we also heard before uh, from one intervention the idea of uh, talking about uh, uh, weapons, not weapons, yes, weapons of mass construction. And I think this is uh, uh, a good phrase, a catchy phrase, uh, to uh, sometimes somehow uh, repropose a theme that uh, was developed in the, in the 50s, in the 60s, uh, during, the, uh, during the Cold War, uh, about the uh, peace offensive. I mean, the concept of peace offensive that uh, uh, some authors have been particularly uh, prominent, uh, like Oswald and others, uh, that uh, thought that in reality, if you do some good, if you uh, propose unilaterally uh, some initiatives uh, that induce reciprocation, that might induce reciprocation by even your own enemy, uh, then you can uh, somehow re-engineer uh, patterns and 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 somehow you can uh, create a reversal of, of the effect. Uh, so the, it's a positive spiral uh, in a sense inducing peace. And and probably this is the one of the things that we should think of right now. I mean whether uh, we have the possibility uh, through uh, non-traditional uh, diplomacy, since uh, traditional diplomacy is failing in so many places, uh, but still insisting on uh, human rights principle, insisting on the rule of law, uh, on developmental issues, as we touched upon before, uh, that uh, can promote a better understanding and trust. I think that both Phoebe and Anna uh, mentioned the word trust, and indeed, if you do not have trust, if you cannot rebuild trust, uh, there is nothing really that you can do, even with an opponent. So you have to play uh, on a level cliff playing field, but at the same time you have to see uh, which, which, which are the ways, which are the mechanisms that can reignite a positive uh, stimulus towards uh, mutual understanding, if not trust. Mutual understanding and trust. One word I want to say about another another. Uh, comment by Professor Shivastava that I understand is no longer with us, but he mentioned rebuilding Gaza. Uh, the word rebuilding Gaza for me is not uh, appropriate. I think we should use the word building back uh, and building back better, as uh, Bill Clinton used to say uh, during the post-tsunami uh, catastrophe. Uh, in reality, it's not rebuilding, it's building uh, a, a, a society, it's building a society where you can have trust with one another, where you can make uh, uh, two states uh, viable, where two, uh, two people uh, can understand one another. So I think that this also this jargon uh, in academic network has to be preserved and understood uh, fully uh, if we want to promote peace. Again, if we want to promote peace. No, just, I just said that and I want now to give the floor to whoever wants to intervene along uh, this uh, a theme of uh, uh, initiatives for peace. So what are the initiatives for peace? Could be the peace offensive that I'm talking about with these possible uh, benefits, uh, even long-term, but still uh, initiatives, even unilateral initiatives that can somehow uh, have a, a snowball effect in a, in a positive way, in a positive cycle. So anybody who wants to intervene, thank you. Well, Donato, if none of our other speakers want to start, I can do that. Sure, that would be great. Thank you, Gary. First, I'd like to thank Alexander and Evo and Anna for putting together this very creative program, and the presentations have been uh, very inspiring, very profound. Uh, 
I think what we what I hear today is the dilemma that we face uh, coming out from both sides. Phoebe's done a wonderful job and others as well of bringing out the potential, the positive potential, unprecedented positive potential that humanity has today. And yet the, the term keeps coming back, but we need trust. And what we see today is a declining sense of trust, a declining sense of self-confidence, a greater sense of un uncertainty and insecurity than perhaps we have since uh, uh, sometime in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, and I think we have to be able to reconcile these apparent contradictions. Un unlimited, unprecedented potential, and yet an unprecedented sense of discontent, confusion, insecurity, resulting in those who want to soar forward with the exciting new technologies, and they are uh, exciting and I think have great potential, and those who want to shrink back. We're going back to the Cold War mentality. We're going back to the polarization of societies. We're going back to competitive nationalism at the same time. And I don't think we can really have this discussion without recognizing at a deeper level the phenomenon that we're going through at a time of unprecedented accomplishment and potential. And I think the two are related. We had a session on this on May 16th, the last session on the uh, first two days of WAS at 64, where we were looking at the root causes. Uh, and our discussion was very similar to this in that many rich perspectives on it. Uh, we seem, uh, Anna was part of that uh, a very interesting discussion. We seem to be the, the, the age of, of, of a bipolar uh, global society is broken up. Uh, unipolarity is certainly already on the decline, but what's going to replace it? Our institutions, we said this in 10 years ago, we, or 11 years ago, we met with the UN in Geneva and had a conference on global challenges. And we, we commented at that and things were looked much more uh, stable and, uh, and manageable at that time than they do today. Uh, they hadn't yet come out of the box and gone in all, in all directions the way they have now. And uh, we concluded at that time we had about 200 diplomats involved in the, in the project, was that none of the problems we confront today, and that was 10 years, 11 years ago, and it's more true, equally or more true today, can be achieved, can be handled by individual nation states on their own. None of them can be addressed uh, by existing institutions the way they're functioning. None of them can be fully resolved through the existing uh, theories and, and strategies and policies that are being implemented. None of them can be achieved or supported by the educational system as it now addresses it's simply lagging too far behind the speed of development and the need for new thinking. And our final conclusion was none of them can be uh, achieved or addressed through the kind of thinking that still prevails uh, and is driving, whether it's our economic systems or our political systems. And we see our thinking politically is really going backwards. We're going back to look at which are the political theories that explain the breakdown of peace, uh, the resurgence of uh, uh, a Cold War mentality and uh, militarization and everything. And I'm emphasizing it not in a pessimistic sense, I think in one sense, this is an unprecedented moment in human history. We have come so far. We have come so close together. Humanity has never been so close together, so interconnected uh, and so capable of coordinated action or thinking on behalf of the totality. But we don't yet have either the ideas or the institutions or the leaders to see it through effectively and the crises we face are compelling us to, to push. Uh, now we're going to have the summit of the future coming up, and there's an important uh, initiative on the reform of the UN. Uh, how far we'll get in that is a question. And 
if we look back in history, the kind of changes that we're going through now, they used to take, not decades, they used to take centuries. Uh, the speed of, with which we're changing, that used to take uh, decades is happening, happening every six months now. So uh, in, instead of depreciating ourselves uh, or uh, feeling that uh, everybody's failing, we're failing, we're trying to do something humanity has never done before. We've never done it. We don't have the leadership, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the expertise or the experience to say we know how to bring ourselves to a next higher level of coordinated action, which will, uh, which will bring everybody, all of us on the same team. And I go back to the theme of human security, not because the academy has been promoting it and uh, Donato and others have mentioned it, but because I think fundamentally the answers, we have wonderful research is being done, the work that Phoebe and her multiple institutions are doing and the practical opportunities that they've un uh, unleashed and the work that Ketan Patel is doing with Force for Good, where he, he believes even today we can meet the SDGs by 2030, which most everybody has abandoned by now. He believes we can finance it. He believes with these technologies, with some 19 or 20 technologies, we can bridge the gaps. Uh, and there are other initiatives that are coming out in their reports. But the question is, do we have the atmosphere? Do we have the supporting environment to do that? When there's so much of discontent, there's so much of, not discontent, just discontent, there's so much of tension and polarization between society, some are tugging to go backwards to the old, while others are tugging to go forward. And I think we have to address that issue first. Uh, if we're gonna, we, need, we have the opportunities, we have the technology, but we don't have the stable environment in order to take it forward. And that's where I think the human security by whatever, what, by circumstance or, or what is exactly the message for today. Peace, we need peace. We cannot do all of this without peace. We'll be using the AI only for more weapons and espionage against each other unless we get beyond this confrontational uh, network. We've got to have peace in order to develop the SDGs. We're now using all of that money to, to go into military spending. We're increasing the military spending when we wanted to redirect it. So the foundation of peace and, the, and so appropriate is the statement that uh, Alexander and Evo have released uh, and are circulating. That has, we cannot do the other things unless we first manage the uh, the, the great growing insecurity, violence, and threats, the unprecedented threats. When, is, when have we heard, even during the Cold War, we didn't have nations and nuclear powers threatening to use their weapons. They may have been planning a sneak attack that nobody would go out and talk about it this way. Uh, so we've got to peace, the, bait, the foundation for peace, then what is it? It's not just a question of having multilateral institutions. We have to have the trust that Phoebe was talking about. We have to have the sense of security because when people are insecure, their first response is, how do I defend myself more? That means more armaments. That means being, being more prepared in case uh, there's an attack. That means more suspicion of others. So peace is not possible without human security. Uh, and human security is not possible without peace. So uh, I'm not trying to sell a, 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 a slogan, but I think we're, we are right in trying to say now, what can we do to, uh, to, in, to come back from the edges of, of violence and, and create that security, not only for human beings, for nations, at a time when it only seems to be getting worse. It seems to me that that's the essential uh, starting point. I think the discussion, and I wind up here because there's so much more to discuss, but I think the discussion of, of AI is really important for that. And I think it was Jonathan, maybe others, who mentioned the potential for, for the first time, we have the possibility of a global system of education that could provide low-cost, high-quality education 
to everybody in the world who wants it. We've never been in that position before. And we've got hundreds of millions of people uh, who, who can't get, uh, or maybe many more than that, who can't get access to that. And their security is going to depend on their capacity to get the knowledge needed. Uh, uh, in the, and for all of us, things are changing so fast. How can we be secure, even if we've just come out of a leading university? If we're not five years later, we won't be able to keep up with the changes that are taking place. It's just happening so quickly. So everybody's insecurity is there. And I think that's if we start there uh, and, and try to address those insecurities, we create the foundation we need to really tap the enormous potentials we have and all of the resources that Phoebe was talking about uh, and Katan has, Katan has been talking about to how to really complete SDGs and the Agenda 2030 in, uh, on t in time. Thank you. Gary, thank you very much for, this is not just an intervention, it's a presentation by itself, but I think it was very helpful for all of us uh, to restate the importance of uh, human security and decline it through the, its own applications in uh, all walks of life. Uh, and in particular for uh, peace and uh, reducing tensions around the world. Anyone wants to uh, intervene on this subject? Alex I see Alexander. Uh, anybody else in the panel? Alexander, thank please, uh, you're muted. I, uh, oh, uh, I must thank first uh, Donato and Gary for these really wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, and what I would like to focus on is... Uh, the reality, the speed of change is faster than ever. We never had such fast changes before, but uh, that means that also the opportunities are bigger than ever. We can do almost, I mean, almost anything that we could imagine, which means that we can do a lot of good stuff, uh, not in 10 years, not in five years, but now, I mean, in a year or two, a lot of things can be done using all these modern technologies. But also at the same time, the dangers are bigger than ever in history. You know, peaceful countries are being bombed. When uh, bombs are falling on your head, then you don't think about anything else. So I think that is something that has to stop first before we can uh, develop all these beautiful ideas and idea future and so on. But first, these bombs must stop. So that's basically, uh, you know, when you drown in high waters, you don't ask if water exists. You learn to swim. You learn to build boats. You, you learn how to make the best use of it. So th that's basically the idea that uh, why uh, uh, Eve actually initiated it and uh, he wrote most of it. I just edited it a little bit. Uh, the statement, which I shared a little bit uh, earlier here in the chat, uh, and the idea of that statement, you know, why is it different? Uh, there have been many statements on, of peace, but uh, there is no peace. So uh, how is this different uh, is that uh, this uh, originates from the Russell Einstein Manifesto. Uh, and we all know that we have to ensure human survival because without it, there is no prosperity. Uh, and uh, how to stop these wars here, the... The focus is actually uh, on international organizations, the UN Security Council, and we know that UN Security Council is blocked when it has to stop the war, then one country says we don't want to stop the war. So therefore, the second focus is also on the population of these countries, so that people from the countries who don't want to stop the war ask, the, not ask, but demand from their leaders to stop the war and to join the resolution and to accept the peace forces into that region so that the region stops being bombed and starts being developed. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, after this is settled, then, of course, all hostages and uh, prisoners have to be exchanged and immediately the reconstruction has to start. But the, the idea is to convince every leader to give up the force for setting disputes, give up the force for grabbing the land. Uh, it's not easy, but I believe that with our resourcefulness, we can do it. So this is basically the motivation. And you can read, of course, the statement. It is in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I'll give the floor to Anna in a second. But I see there are very interesting comments in the chat. Uh, and I would like to ask the uh, facilitators if they can uh, allow Bezir and Hugo, Hugo Bardi, Bezir Rex, and uh, uh, Hugo Bardi to come in and ask their questions after Anna speaks. Anna? Thank you so much. Um, 
I am um, a bit inspired by uh, this term, uh, weapon of mass construction, which Paul Srivastava mentioned. So my suggestion would be that we also start to change the way we speak, the way we talk. So we, uh, for example, I would suggest that we use the words peace, trust, respect in every possible way we can. So to do conferences on trust, uh, uh, songs on respect, uh, uh, exhibitions on dialogue. So to use it in popular culture also, maybe we could invite also uh, uh, creative people, artists, uh, uh, songwriters, everyone who can contribute by building these, these positive words, this uh, weapon of mass construction, so that we also with uh, what we, because language is also very important. If we talk always about security, always about destruction, always about, I don't know, wars, conflicts, we should also strengthen positive terms, positive, uh, positive concepts by using them as much as possible, by using them in popular culture, making movies, making uh, uh, it visible on social media, making campaigns, campaigns on trust, campaigns on respect, on dialogue. So using these terms, uh, these good positive terms and strengthen it that way. So I'm inspired by this. Uh, we can all be a weapon of mass construction. Thank you, Anna, for enforcing the message for our peace offensive. This is, I would like to call it, the peace offensive uh, and time it. Actually, it's also important because initiatives have to roll one after the other one in order to build uh, some strength and visibility. Uh, and uh, But I, I asked uh, the facilitators if we can allow Hugo Bardi to come in and, uh, and Basir White uh, that have exchanged so many messages. I don't know if that is possible. Um, and Moniz. Thank you very much, especially Alexandra and Ivo for organizing this. It's very timely. The subjects are very important and the issues raised so far are, are, are fascinating, really. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been positively provoked by Gary's passionate statement of a few moments ago. Um, and uh, I must admit, I've not seen Gary so moved uh, by what's happening on the international scene for a while. Um, I understand his viewpoint, of course. I would add that, and uh, I think Donato might concur with me on this, is that there's tremendous lack of leadership on the international arena political leaders from all over the world, here in the Middle East, in Europe, North America, do not seem to see what's really going on or take the moral high ground on critical issues that are affecting human lives every day uh, 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 throughout the world. For science, and technology for scientists and technologists to be effective, um, they need to have the political masters reading from the same hymn sheet. This is sadly not happening at all. I've been reviewing a lot of the literature that and, and many of the statements that political leaders throughout the world really have been giving on uh, the problems of Europe, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, or Russia-Ukraine war, the Middle East uh, uh, situation. And there's very little sense that's coming out from most of the leaders. And the problem is that, you know, um, uh, political leaders are still thinking in, uh, or have the mindset of the 60s and 70s when information was hardly was not available to the ordinary public, to the ordinary people to uh, uh, to think about and basically come out with unbelievably senseless um, statements on critical issues that are affecting our lives every hour, every day. Um, so um, this is not my answer to Gary's question or note, but I'm 
deeply, deeply troubled by the lack of leadership uh, on the international arena that is resulting in loss of human life, in serious um, development problems, in serious economic um, uh, uh, problems, in hyperinflation in certain countries, in uh, basically obliterating a lot of the good work that scientists, technologists, development workers, sustainable development champions have done over 30, 40 years. This is being uh, systematically um, undermined by the lack of political leadership in many, many parts of the world. And that's a real concern. Monif, yes, we share your concern, of course. Uh, it's a lack of leadership. It's also lack of observance of what are the human rights principles, of what are the uh, treaties that, uh, that states uh, conclude, but they are not respected. So lack of respect. And uh, the word respect came out also during this uh, um, webinar. I think it's respect by all means, respect in terms of of international obligations uh, and and among people in general and trust as we said Hugo are you still with us would you like to come in so we touched on so many points uh, Donato that I'm not sure what I can say but you noted on the discussion the chat that we did, we moved into chemistry which is which is a very interesting subject there are so many things which have to do with security and um this uh, colleague, uh, Bezir, is, uh, he, he raised a question that I had not thought about because we are manufacturing a lot of bad stuff in companies, private companies, and in a situation in which we are at risk because of climate change, because of evil intentions of people. It's, uh, it, this kind of stuff can amplify the damage which could be created by, both by natural events and and um, and simply mis simple mistakes or military actions. So that's another 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 big problem. So I we we list the, we list the problems. I could stay here two hours just listing them. So I I will stop here. Just just noting that I am a chemist by formation, so I can see. The problems with so many chemical substances, which are produced in huge amounts and um, diffused over the over the environment, the atmosphere, and other things. Even um, we breathe things. There was an article on the Washington Washington Post uh, two days ago saying, "Well, you, you did you notice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we are all breathing microplastics?" Wow. No, we hadn't noticed. I don't know about you, colleagues, but but it is a um, difficult perspective. So I hope that it, artificial intelligence can help us also in this field because it is extremely complex. We need data. We need to elaborate data. We are in a, one of those cases in which we speak of big data. Big data is a typical field for in, artificial intelligence where it can help a lot. But as Gary said... Uh, we need we need we need something new. We need something different. We need to go into this thing because it's we arrived all the way to here. We did so much as human beings up to now, and the, the whole thing seems to be destroying ourselves. The whole purpose of the whole exercise seems to have arrived there to this. Anyway, uh, let's keep going. It's uh, it's uh, in a certain sense fascinating, and I'm, I'm sure we will have more to discuss in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo, for coming in. Uh, Alexander, I don't think we still have time. Uh, we have some more time. Uh, in this case, I will ask Anna to come in. I see your second round, so keep it short, please, Anna. Thank you. I will just make a question for everyone uh, because I agree that we, I think that we all concluded that through uh, the tools as artificial intelligence or education, we can influence the future leaders and the future generations. But a, a question for everyone, uh, what can we do now to influence the current world leaders? So not as individuals, but as organizations. What can we do right now to influence these uh, current world leaders that are 
a part of the problem, no, obviously not a part of the solution. Or correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe there is a there is a, a, they are also a part of the solution. Thank you. Uh, I, I I think maybe it's too early to come up with a, a response, but uh, we we said that we are going to elaborate some good ideas. Uh, I think we had some catchy words and and concepts, as we said, uh, weapons of mass construction. And uh, I reiterated the importance of uh, a peace offensive that can be timed uh, throughout many initiatives in a sort of calendar that uh, scientists uh, of all branches of knowledge could join. So I think a peace offensive in, in that sense could be uh, a way to, to achieve something or at least to be visible on that front. Uh, but before giving the floor to any of the present speakers, I, I hear that Besir again is online. Can we try again, Besir? First of all, I'd like to express my greetings and salute uh, to Ugo. I took critical infrastructure protection almost uh, 12 years ago. Uh, and there, you know, you could take certain actions to for protective measures against terrorism, insider threats, and this and that. But I mean, I'm not a scientist, not a chemist. But when it comes to industrial security, there are things that you do. But the stuff that you do is almost 50 to 100 years old. And with the reality of the current uh, obvious extreme weather events, as I've stated, you know, more has to be uh, done and perhaps complete uh, recalculations and revamping and in a way de-risking the entire uh, chemical and biological against uh, catastrophic uh, hazards. And on the uh, AI front, I think we need uh, good science, not bad science. I say good science, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even 70 years ago, there was bad science when it came to uh, medicine, you know, as the human subjects uh, were uh, used and uh, all the way to uh, outright uh, uh, medical uh, genocide, the way it was done. So uh, that was bad science, but as a result of it, there are safeguards on how scientific experiments are con conducted and how psychological experiments are uh, conducted. But that concept should also apply to AI, because uh, 10 years ago, when I've uh, flagged uh, cloud security risks and so forth, I became persona non grata. But of course, surely uh, time proved uh, me right in many ways. So. Uh, that should be done because you really cannot expect uh, companies to be completely good corporate citizens and uh, ethical actors. And what is the way? Uh, more independent uh, uh, review and uh, integrity uh, programs before you can achieve trust. I mean, trust is the absolute pinnacle. But before trust, you know, obviously, respect and compliance and uh, good co-working uh, should be achieved. NATO has uh, carried out uh, for many, many decades uh, scientific diplomacy that included many partner countries and uh, Russia. Uh, so, you know, that has been done, but obviously it's all of the powers in the eye of the beholder. Same thing with the AI. You know, you could develop the utmost new technologies, but let's say if uh, ill-intentioned actors are going to steal it, so you are at a disadvantage and forced to uh, up uh, your defenses. So it's all to do with uh, putting things in a more concrete way. And I am very worried about the chemical and the biological hazards because World War II has long ended. And then, you know, when you think of the planet trying to recover itself and also the nuclear uh, testing and, uh, but, you know, we have to do a whole lot more to achieve uh, intergenerational fairness because it is going to be a legacy that we are going to provide. And I don't think we could easily transfer the Earth into another plant. Grazie mille. And thank sure. you very much. Grazie. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, thanks. Uh, I see that there is Monif who wants maybe to say something more. If it's short, Monif, the floor is yours. Then Gary. Maybe, Gary, you will conclude because I think we are beyond uh, the allotted time. Um, well, one, yeah, one minute. I think uh, there is no quick uh, answer to the question as to what could be done. But I think organizations such as WAS should mobilize, for the lack of a better word, mobilize Nobel laureates, thought leaders, international figures, even business people who are influential in political circles to try and really steer 
our politicians, our leaders throughout the world and try and hammer some sense into their minds to avoid some serious problems that are coming up if current political trends continue. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very uh, practical and, uh, and timely. Uh, Gary, I think we, we can conclude the discussion. I don't know if you want to have a sort of wrap up of what uh, what you what is your take out of this, uh, of what what uh, so many uh, good fellows have said, and uh, what you think we should do in future. Okay. Well, my thanks to all of you, the speakers, and all who have uh, been part of this and contributed. And I'm not a, going to an attempt a, anything like a, a, a wrap up that will do justice. But I think that the, the question that Anna raised is really the, the question that we should go away with. Uh, and it's the question we've been asking at the board level in the academy and we've been discussing among ourselves. What can we do under these extraordinary circumstances where none of the standard formulas or past wisdom uh, is, uh, really seems to fit? And that goes right back to the the motto of the academy uh, that what we really are we are not political leaders we're not the uh, we're not the financial leaders for sure uh, but what the world needs now is leadership and thought and not of any particular organization it needs but we don't we see so much coming out in the press we, we read so much but very little of it really looks at the big picture and what's the way out of this. We take sides, we condemn the other side, we, another uh, 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 horrible event has taken place, another threat, an exchange of threats, and how are we going to uh, increase our military spending and respond to that. And I don't think, uh, I think we do lack, I agree 100% that we lack the leadership we need, but you know, leaders are born of a time it's very difficult for leaders to be much better than the societies in which they live. And the content, look at the contention in all the societies that's there. Leaders have to compromise and find a middle path. It takes a very great visionary leader, uh, maybe uh, Gorbachev is the best example, that to, to rise above the mentality of the society that they're leading. That's rare that we get people of that caliber and that vision. Uh, but organizations, not an organization, but organizations that don't have anything to gain by taking a position on one side or another, but looking at it from the perspective of the whole, and the whole is humanity, and what do we need, and coming together and creating a consensus of what's needed. Just a couple of days ago, Paul uh, invited me uh, to a meeting of 30 NG, leading NGOs next month to address this very subject of the, the future. Uh, and, and where can we, we've all been focusing on our special expert areas of expertise, our particular uh, uh, sectors and uh, priorities and, and disciplines and all. What we really need to now is to build a consensus among thought leaders and thought leading organizations rather than just depending on individuals to come out with a voice that's strong enough to say, hey, this is unprecedented in history. None of the old books, none of the old script and strategy books are gonna get us out of this. We have to go beyond and rise beyond our differences and our suspicions and our distrust in order to do it. Three years ago, uh, we conducted what we called uh, a, a WAS at 60, which was the first general assembly we'd had in quite some time. And one of the sessions we had was on the need for a global social movement of transformation. That nothing short of that was going to be necessary because we had to move as one and we had to move to a new level of understanding, perception, attitudes, values, and organizations. And at that time, we voiced the idea which uh, John Miller and Caton and others uh, uh, associated with the academy are trying to do. We said we need a global platform that's really not the voice of a political party, or not only the voice of a nation, but the voice of humanity 
in an area where there's a consensus. And I think, uh, uh, I think that's got to be the youth. The youth who are not so much conditioned by the past that we've lived through, who are going to live through the future, and, it, and, and, and we need their uh, active involvement to do it. So we're talking about a global social movement. Uh, who has ever created a global social movement? <laughs> uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, it's unprecedented. But if there were, was ever a time when we need something like that, and when we need credible uh, organizations that have the interest and commitment to humanity as a whole, I think that's the kind of leadership we need. It's not the leader, individual leader of a country who's going to be torn by political pressures within. But it could be many polit former political leaders uh, who uh, rise above the perspectives of their country and the politics of their country. I think it's something like that is the, uh, and the very reason that uh, we encourage this discussion and the programs that have been going on in WASIT 64, and we have another two, two days of it coming up uh, this month, later this month, is precisely for that, to get the thinking can we come to some clarity or consensus on the thinking necessary to forge that new direction and to give direction to the leadership? Because it's not the individual, <laughs> it's, the, it's the ideas and direction and, uh, and values that they're going to espouse. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, Alexander. I think we have to conclude here. Uh, yes. Uh, because uh, yeah. we should have started actually with uh, the, the last concluding session with uh, Saula is uh, chairing oh, so, uh, like so minutes Sao, ago. Sao, Sao uh, so now the question in. is how to proceed. Do we still have a few minutes? Wait, Sao, to, uh, I yes, I, I, go ahead. yes, I believe yes. that I, I can yes. finish in five minutes. I need only five minutes. I will Perfect. jump to, Thank you. to the synthesis of the most promising ideas and projects and plan of action for selected idea. I, I will try to, to synthesize it all the, the speech that we, we heard today, Paul Srivastava talked about the war, war is not a solution, and ask for uh, out-of-the-box thinking, we need to, to have one. Uh, the war and peace were problems before climate change uh, appears as a problem to us, uh, peace was the central issue for Cliba from a precondition for human security. And I uh, started to, to talk uh, about Gaza and how to rebuild, or as Dodonat talked about, build a better uh, Gaza. Uh, and he talked about reconstruction with the use of technology, but he didn't know exactly uh, what kind of technology we, we could use to that for that. And uh, he, he finished his, his speech speaking about uh, human security and uh, scholarships. And he talked about uh, the formation of leaders. And uh, I, I imagine that I remember the Barcelona project, the idea to identify people that could have the future leaders and the World Academy could take care about them and uh, try to find them, try to, 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 to follow scholarships and uh, to interfere in the, in the global leadership in some sense. Uh, and uh, I believe that it could be an action that we could include in, in our plan, the idea of scholarships and leadership and formation of leadership. And Phoebe, after, after Paul, uh, Phoebe Konduri, uh, talked about the sustainable development goals, uh, inter- and transdisciplinary ways, global agenda, and uh, asked about uh, how the solutions could be implemented, who will finance the solutions. We don't have exactly the ability to implement it. And I believe that uh, this idea could be linked with the, the, the formation of leaders. We need the leaderships uh, to implement it. So the, 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 
the work of the or the academy could could be associated with this. In the third uh, session, John Miller talked about artificial intelligence, the two sides of the artificial intelligence, the extraordinary fast de development of the artificial intelligence, what is here, and, and he talked about artificial intelligence, AI can program AI. Uh, it's the generative uh, artificial intelligence and talk a lot about the risks and even the solution needs to use the artificial intelligence but he 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 talked about an op optimistic scenario about uh, healthcare diminishing time for new therapies new medicines educational applications government facilities and uh, the possibility to, to identify patterns for for human security uh, regarding climate, regarding food distribution. Kenneth Stokes uh, also uh, talked about inter artificial intelligence uh, and the, the risk of it, uh, how to identify anomalous information by networks uh, and the risk to to replicate old concepts and uh, uh, if you imagine the ability to to that the artificial intelligence has to to work in wars and took decisions and take the decisions inside the war it's it's very complicated. We we, we re always remember the movies, the American movies that shows what happens when the artificial uh, intelligence took take the, the control of all. And Gary, Gary spoke about uh, the session four, unprecedented positive potential that we have nowadays, the challenges that we have nowadays, the polarization of the society, the nationalism, multipolarity. What could replace the the institutions, the the current institutions, and uh, the existing institutions are not able to the challenges that we face nowadays, reform of the United Nations, the speed of changes, and um, uh, I believe that we can I can conclude with um, my last point, the, the plan of action. I would like to insist with the idea of scholarships and the uh, formation of leaders, uh, maybe linked with the Barcelona project and try to, to find a, a way to, to finance it. And uh, I believe that artificial intelligence, uh, we, we need to, as a think tank that World Academy is, we need to, to to have uh, 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 an idea about the risks and opportunities and the algorithm and the manipulations that the algorithm can produce, uh, the interferences in, in the democracy and the public opinion. So it's a dirty, in my opinion, uh, for each uh, think tank like uh, World Academy to, to have uh, and a statement to to enact a report about risks and opportunities and uh, regulation for regulation of artificial intelligence. We need to to be aware about it, and also we need to uh, support the change of the structure of international institutions. We we need to produce more and more statements and and reports and and work on it. And uh, as Gary told uh, to us uh, since uh, some minutes ago, we are not a political institution. We are not political leaders, but uh, uh, we can influence. They need the uh, ideas. They need the path. They need the directions. They need the uh, constructions. Uh, and we can offer it to them. And uh, as a think tank uh, that we are, we 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 can we can try to produce a, a substantial report 
about artificial intelligence, about the change of the global institutions, about uh, and the work with scholarships and formation of uh, new leaders. I believe that we we can we can we can imagine this kind of things like uh, an action plan to to us. It's uh, well, I, I believe that I, it was what I, I absorbed from the the speech and uh, what I could put inside a, a plan uh, at this moment. It was my contribution today. Thanks. Thanks for all the, the, the participation, by the participation. Okay. Uh, many thanks, dear Saulo, for this wonderful summary of today's uh, webinar. And many thanks also to everybody for great ideas for sticking out to the end. We have actually around, around, uh, arrived to the last point on the agenda, which is the conclusion. So in this last minute, I am just going to first convey uh, greetings from Ivo Schlaus, who is still with us. And I, I would like to thank everybody for really wonderful contributions, for great energy, uh, for great thoughts, for great insights, uh, for... Uh, really uh, wonderful ideas and wonderful proposals. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but we have a lot of energy. And those great proposals uh, that were so beautifully summarized now by Saulo, uh, of course, among others, we do peace offensive, we build weapons of mass construction, we support Stop the Wars Now initiative. And what is most important is we keep this discussion alive. So we produce further ideas, was projects in the future, was dialogues. And thank you. Take care and see you soon.